Hello, Global Gardeners. It's Monday, and it's time to talk gardening. I'm back after a missing a week, and I want to give a shout out to Rick, because even though I say it's Monday for Rick in Sydney, it's actually Tuesday already. So thanks for staying up for us, Rick. I hope you can make it through most of the show. Today, we're going to be talking about your fall garden, which is very similar to your spring garden. And so for many of us, it's the middle of summer, but for some of us, it's the middle of winter. And too often we start thinking about gardening with a focus on the summer garden and the seeds that we buy and the seeds that we start indoors and the plants we put outside and all of our activities tend to be focused on summer gardening. But with just a little bit of extra effort, a little bit of extra attention, we can have an extra spring garden and an extra fall garden. And that's the kind of stuff we'll be talking about today. How to extend your entire growing season on the front side and the back side to get as much growing as possible. Too many of us, I think almost all of us, when we first start gardening, that's all we think about is we put the bean seeds in the ground and we grow our tomato plants and we don't even get started gardening until right before summer. And then we grow through summer and then the plants start to fade and then we harvest everything and there's still lots of good time for growing. The weather can still be good even into winter, we can be growing plants in our garden. So those are the kind of things we'll be talking about today. Throw your questions out there. It's always nice to see you. We have Canada well represented today. We've got Arkansas, we've got Hawaii, we've got Belgium. This is just such a wonderful global group of gardeners and I really am glad to be back. I was traveling last Monday at this time and I'd much rather be here with you than on the road. Had a good trip. I'll talk a little bit about it as we uh, finish up today. But today, right now, for the next hour and a half, we'll be focusing on the gardening stuff. Great to have you here. Jay and Heidi as well, our wonderful moderators as we move into the show. And it's, it's just so nice to see all the conversations going back and forth, all of the talk, all of the regulars. Uh, you all are just such a wonderful part of my my Monday and of my gardening week in general. So uh, let's go ahead and see. Rachel is saying, I have an overgrown strawberry bed that needs pruning and slug treatment. Any videos that y'all know of that can help? So I I have a video on how to propagate strawberries, and that's actually one of the things I do when I need to deal with overgrown strawberry beds. I'll, I'll dig up any of the runners that have rooted or any of the young plants and I'll pot them up to move to other areas of the garden, to move into my green stock vertical tower, to move into individual pots, or just start growing strawberries in a whole new section of the garden. So th that's one option is to just go ahead and use this as an opportunity to propagate the plants. Slugs can definitely be a problem. I, th I think the easiest, <coughs> excuse me, easiest way to deal with slugs is trapping. And so put some wet cardboard, wet carpet, something near those strawberry plants and the slugs are typically overnight going to crawl into that wet space, rolled up newspaper, and then you can just toss the whole thing or deal with the slugs individually. The beer traps actually work or you bury a cup of beer. Uh, that's one way to do it. But you can also, by thinning out the plants and by digging up and potting up some of those plants, you can open up the space. And I think when you have a whole bunch of strawberries growing really close together, the slugs just go nuts because they're hidden from birds and snakes and everything else. But when you open up the bed by cleaning it up, you, now you can allow some of those natural predators to help you out as well because the slugs don't have as many places to hide. So that's the only video I have on the strawberries in particular. 
but anyone else out there that have uh, suggestions, by all means, share them. So Dr. Trod is saying, thank you for that tomato trellis video. My mortgage lifter snapped due to bad staking. At least I was able to rescue nine huge tomatoes. Just put them in a box with apples to ripen. Awesome. That's a great way to, to ripen un, under ripe tomatoes, like from a broken plant or if you, if you harvest because you got a lot of bad weather coming in. And so the video just came out on Saturday. It's, it's about the Florida weave method of trellising the tomatoes, very effective. You can use the same type of weave, the same type of support for any vining plant. You can do it with, with beans, with cucumbers, with squash, with melon. The, the biggest concern with some of those other plants I have is how those plants grow and you might need extra staking. So as I showed in the video, I just have a couple heavy duty posts and then I can string twine in between those posts and that supports the tomato plants very well because the tomato plant itself is pretty sturdy and when it grows vertically it basically holds its own weight as it grows up but when you look at vining plants like squash and melon and cucumbers their vines their stems are not erect they're not as as sturdy as a tomato plant. So they're going to put a lot more weight onto the twine. The, the twine and the tomatoes, the twine just kind of guides the tomatoes and the tomatoes hold themselves up for the most part. The other plants, you might need more stakes and more posts to support that extra weight as those melons start getting uh, fruit and it's a heavy fruit. That's going to weigh down on the twine if that's all you're using is the twine. So you can use that with other type of plants. Just be aware you might need additional support for, for the heavy plants. But it works beautifully with tomatoes, which is why I wanted to go ahead and do that video. Because I've been doing it for years, that type of trellising system. But it's, it's not something that, uh, that I've shared before, really. So glad that you enjoyed the video. Glad it's working. And now I'm looking forward to the fall garden. The tomatoes being supported by that kind of trellis by, by all means, my cucumbers are starting to grow up into my, my cattle panel hoops, which I'm also using as a trellis. They're going to be fruiting very, very soon, but we still have a lot of time in our season. Many of us were late this year getting our plants started, especially here in Colorado, because we just had such a cold spring and the soil was just too cool to, to grow in until the beginning of June. So we've had less than two months for our gardens to be growing. I know many of you are already harvesting plants that you've had in the ground for months and months. And that, that's why you need to start thinking about what's next. When the cucumber plants are fading, what goes in next? Even when the tomato plants begin to get too big and tall, or if you're growing determinate tomatoes and you've harvested everything, what next? You're going to pull that plant out, something else needs to go in. And that's the idea behind the fall garden, is putting more plants in. Don't just calling an end to the season because the cucumbers are done or the melons are done or or you've finished your harvest, put something else into the ground. So I'm going to ask a, a, a easy question because this also ties into fall gardening. Have you ordered your garlic yet? Most of the focus on a fall garden is planting in summer for harvesting in fall. But I also think we need to think in terms of what we're going to plant in fall to overwinter and then be part of the next year's garden. And garlic falls into that category. Right now in August is the time to start ordering your garlic that you won't be planting until September or October. If you wait until September or October to get the garlic that you want to plant, it might be too late. You might not be able to have many options it won't have the choices. You might not even have any availability. So now is actually a really good time to start ordering your garlic. 
And the same holds true for, for Rick and all the others that are in the Southern Hemisphere. Have you ordered your asparagus? Asparagus is one of those plants that goes in the ground in very early spring. We might think of it as a late spring or early summer kind of crop, but the plants go in very early while they're still dormant. And if you wait until early spring to order and try to find asparagus roots to put in the ground, it's going to be too late. So plan ahead as you start thinking about the, the spring gardens and the fall gardens and ordering some of those things that you're going to need to order, like the garlic or the asparagus, but also the seeds. And, and this is one of those things I, I, I think our, many of our seed companies really do a disservice because they send out all the catalogs in December and January and we order all of our seeds and there really isn't the same type of marketing or push to gardeners to get seeds in summer for your fall garden. So if you don't have the seeds for a fall garden, sorry for that because none of the stores have seeds anymore really to speak of. Maybe some of the nurseries might have seeds, but you really need to start planning well ahead for a fall garden. I've noticed a couple of the stores still have some racks of seeds. And so ties in to my question, have you bought your garlic yet? Go to the store, your nursery, the big box centers, and try to find the seeds at which what's for them, the end of the season. Right now is clearance mode for many of these, these garden centers. Now might be a great time to not only get the seeds for your fall garden, but to get them at a discount because they're on clearance. So planning ahead, thinking ahead well before the plants are actually going to be growing can really be beneficial as we start thinking about a fall garden. More on all that to come. Let's see what we, uh, what else we have. Russell says, I grew some awesomely huge garlic from bulbs I bought at the grocery store. <coughs> that's great. That's, that's one of those things. Uh, that usually if you get uh, an, an organic garlic bulb, you can grow those and it doesn't always have to be organic. It's just that often the, the run of the mill garlic bulbs sometimes are treated so that they don't sprout while they're sitting in the store. So they don't always grow as well. But uh, yeah, that's definitely, I'm, I'm actually got some videos coming up of some of the things I've got at the grocery store and then start growing them in my garden. So look for those in the months ahead. It's one of those, those things that we, too often don't think about as an option. Just going through your produce section and getting some of the things that you would normally cook in the kitchen and turning them into something you can actually start growing in the garden. Okay, Frank says, I work at a box store. Seeds very soon to be cleared out for Halloween space. There you go. Thank you, Frank. And that's exactly my point. I I'd, I'd, I'd sent a picture to, to my kids a couple days ago because it it's happening here too. The Halloween stuff is already in the stores and it kind of drives me a little bit nuts because it it was July and we're already putting things in the store for the end of October. That's just craziness. But yes, they're clearing out things like seeds to make room for that. So get out there, get those purchased right now so you can go ahead and start putting them in. Paul's wondering, is it too early to start turnip, collards, and mustard greens indoors in zone nine? So great question. And so as we talk about a fall garden, the, the intent is to choose the type of plants that can grow well when the temperatures start to drop. Right now, for many of us, it is the peak of summer. It's hot it's going to cool down. We can start seeds now or in the next month or so. And as the temperatures drop, as the nights and days are cooler, there are a whole bunch of plants that like those type of conditions. So when you look at a fall garden, those are the kind of plants to focus on. 
Get away from the peppers and the squashes and the melons and the tomatoes because it's going to be too cold for them. Instead, focus on turnips and collards and mustard greens and beetroot and lettuce and spinach and Swiss chard and peas and carrots. You can see there's a long list of plants that can handle the cool conditions. The same plants that you're putting in an early spring garden are the same plants that you can grow in a fall garden. So that's the first stage is choosing the plants. And especially if you can get seeds right now for cheap, whatever the seeds are that you can get that fall into that cool season category, go ahead and get them. And that may help define what your fall garden is going to look like. The second piece, and this is a really good point and, and why Paul's question is so good, is it, it, the timing and the plant choice will vary based on your zone. Now, the zone itself, you're in 9A, I'm in 5B, the zone doesn't really matter when it comes to growing your plants, these type of plants, your vegetable garden plants. But... When we can look at our zone to get an idea of how cold our winter's going to be. That's, that's how our zones are defined is the coldest average winter temperature. So for me in zone 5B, my coldest average winter temperature is minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about minus 26 Celsius. And the ground starts freezing in December. So my fall garden actually extends from September to October, November, and then I'm done in December. For a zone 9A, your ground may never freeze. In fact, I'm guessing that you, you don't have freezing ground. You'll get the temperatures at or slightly below freezing, but you can actually grow throughout the entire winter with these plants that you're choosing to grow. And so as, as to your question, is it too early to start those indoors? I would probably say yes, just assuming that your summer is, is going to continue. My first freeze is going to come in September. You're not going to get that. So, so it might be a little bit early to, to start for you. It's not too early to start for me. Or maybe for you, you have to look at when your first frost is going to hit in fall. And that's a good indicator of when to start your seeds. And so look at the seed packet. Most seed packets are written for the spring and summer garden. And so they'll, they'll say to start the seeds outdoors three weeks before the last frost date. Well, you can kind of reverse that and and start thinking about that in the fall, that if you can put seeds in the garden before the first frost date, then you can put those same seeds in the garden in summer and they'll grow after the first frost date. And so you can, you can play this a little bit. A lot of it comes with experience and time and experimenting and figure out what actually works best in your area. In zone nine, my brother in Arizona, I think he's in zone nine, can't grow a vegetable garden in the summer. It's just too hot. So he starts looking at fall growing because the conditions are going to be much cooler. And that's what I'm guessing you're thinking about doing as well, Paul. I would suggest, especially in zone eight and zone nine, you don't need to start some of these seeds indoors. The turnips, the beetroot, the Swiss chard, Go ahead and just sow those seeds in your garden beds without starting them indoors and you'll have ample time for them to to start growing and august for almost all of us is a good time to start direct sowing your seeds into your vegetable garden for the fall crops it it's probably a little bit early for mustard greens and collards and spinach and lettuce to be starting indoors for very hot regions. But again, you can grow those from seed outdoors. So anything that you might be thinking about growing indoors, go ahead and shift the mindset a little bit and go ahead and 
just direct sow them outdoors instead of growing the plants and then transplanting into the garden here in another month or two just go ahead and start the seeds that's that's even in my short season i found that to to be pretty effective and and a way to get my fall season growing now there are some that do take a little bit longer and and yes if if you're still at the peak of summer but yet like me you you have the frosts come in september august is a good time to be starting the collards and the spinach and the lettuce and the brassicas the plants that are going to need some time and don't like the baking sun you can go ahead and start those indoors and then transplant them into the garden at the end of august or the beginning of september then they can get established before the frost hits and many of them don't even really notice that the frost has hit the the the, the weird weather we have here in colorado there's usually that one day in september where we have a frost and sometimes it's it's even a hard freeze when the plants can get past that one day we have a another month september into october where sometimes we don't get any more freezing weather so how how have you tracked the weather in your garden because you can use that to your advantage here i can put my seeds in the ground in august and start growing them knowing that i'm going to get that frost or freeze in september but if i cover my plants with plastic or with a tarp something on that one day when we get that first freeze then after that the plants will keep growing and they actually will do very well so you have to tie in your own local weather to your timing and your plant selection and whether you put plants in or whether you put seeds in uh, as part of the fall garden so uh, Lama Lama says it was 109 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about 43 degrees Celsius on Saturday. That's hot. And today's supposed to be 88 with abundant lightning. I can plant the fall seeds now. Absolutely. Hopefully we'll get lots of rain to put out the fires up the road from us. Yeah. And, and so uh, that's another thing I've been looking at. We're, we're in our monsoon season. And, and we started this year with no snow, no rain. And over the last couple of weeks, we've actually had a lot of rain, more rain than than I can remember. I, had, I actually had 1.3 inches of rainfall in my garden a couple of days ago. That never happens here. And it wasn't associated with thunderstorms. We just have a monsoon season that's really developing well here. Great time of year to be starting seeds if you have a similar weather pattern because the cooler conditions and the moist conditions from the rain are ideal for germinating all these types of plants we're, we're talking about. These are seeds that are used to growing in the spring in cool conditions. So they love cool conditions of summer and the moist soil. So absolutely get out there and start doing it. Data Cook is asking, I'm in zone 4A and growing elephant garlic and with back to Eden method. How deep should I cover with wood chips? And so uh, you don't grow in the wood chips. I, I hope you're thinking and putting in uh, in the soil. So bury the clove twice the height of the clove. An elephant garlic is, is bigger. So you can actually put the clove in the soil. About an inch and a half deep is probably a good start. And then go ahead. I use the straw mulch and I cover with two to four inches of straw going into the winter. And so with the uh, back to Eden method where you're using wood chips, uh, as long as it's a light wood chip, you should be able to do two to three inches without too much trouble. And then in spring, the garlic will just punch right up through that. The garlic has such a sturdy stem and leaves that uh, they can even punch up through the wood chips. But I wouldn't go more than three inches. Um, probably two would be a little bit um, better in in the spring but for 4a where it's going to get below uh, minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit it well, actually closer to to minus 25 probably is what you I'm guessing you're used to seeing 
yeah, probably three inches of wood chips would be a good target and maybe even a little bit more. And then in the spring, when things start warming up, you can brush off some of those wood chips so that the garlic doesn't have to punch through as much of that mulch. But they, the protection is not so much for the clove because even in my area, the ground freezes. And so the garlic cloves will overwinter in frozen ground and frozen ground is a consistent temperature. The, the temperature of my frozen ground is exactly the same temperature of your frozen ground because ice is a relatively constant temperature. It's when the plants start to emerge that you need the mulch for. It's the mulch helps, helps protect the young garlic plant. So if you if you put the garlic in too soon and it starts growing, the mulch helps protect it from the winter weather. And in spring, if it starts growing but it's still cold out, the mulch helps protect those young plants. So that's really the reason for it. And uh, a couple inches should should be fine with the, the wood chip mulch that you're, you're using. Uh, okay, I'm going to go ahead and scroll down and catch up. I had it on pause for a little bit. Um, <clears throat> Hot Pepper Saul, Paul says, just signed up for chip drop. Plan to use them for paths and such. That's awesome. Getchipdrop.com is the website here in the States. And it's it's an awesome way to get a bunch of mulch. That you, I wouldn't recommend that kind of mulch for things like garlic because it tends to be pretty chunky. But yeah, great idea, Paul, to put it into your pathways. And I put it around my trees and, and uh, my perennial bushes as well. And I, I showed that, actually I have a short on the YouTube channel where I show getting my chip drop drop, and uh, put the, that in the garden and also have uh, had kind of a, I've done this before and hopefully I'll have a video about it next year, especially with all this rain, but getting free chips like that from, from chip drop and just putting it in a big pile, especially if you live in a wet region, it'll break down and you'll have a nice, compost on the inside of that pile in time. So I'm kind of hoping for that, especially with all of this that we have. Uh, Raquel's wondering, can I put in potatoes in the fall instead of the spring? Maybe. <clears throat> and so especially if you're in zone nine um, or zone eight even, <clears throat> you might be able to, to put your potatoes in in fall. And I'm assuming in those zones, you have a, a very late first frost. And so you might be able to put in a potato crop and have it grow and have it harvest before the cold temperatures kill off your, your potato plants. So very possible. For some of us, we can't. The, the, my freezing temperatures are gonna be coming soon enough that I can't get a second potato crop. And so it depends on, on your garden and how soon your your, your freezing, hard freezing weather comes. That's what's going to affect the, the potatoes. Most potato plants can handle a, a frost, but they can't handle that hard freeze. Um, so possibly, depending on how cold you're going to get and how soon that's going to happen, you might be able to get some some potatoes in, in the ground but before uh, before all that happens. And, and that, that's a great opportunity if you can do that. Cucumbers, actually, there, there are many of the plants we think of as a summer crop that we don't think of as a fall crop. If you have a late first frost, you might be able to get a, a, a complete separate second crop of fast growing squashes and cucumbers. And I try this most years and, and it all depends to how crazy my Colorado weather gets, but, but some of those fast growing vining plants might only be 60 or 70 days to harvest. And so if you put in a cucumber seed in your garden on the 1st of August, then you can expect to be harvesting the first week of October. Well, if your first freeze in fall doesn't happen until the end of October or the beginning of November, then yeah, you can get some of those summer plants growing into a fall garden as well. So much of the focus, so much of what I talk about are the cool season plants that can handle the frost. But think about the, the potatoes and the cucumbers and the squashes that grow quickly, and you might be able to get them into your fall garden as well. 
Ditto Kook, thank you so much for that contribution. I appreciate it. Planting in soil with cover. Great. Yes, that's that's definitely the way to do it. So I'm glad to hear that. And uh, good luck with that. I actually, um, because I was gone most of this last week, just harvested my garlic. And it's beautiful. I, I had to delay a little bit because of all the rains. I don't like to, to harvest garlic in the the wet, soggy soil, but I had to go ahead and harvest it just because it was getting too late. The, the plants were telling me they needed to be harvested. The leaves were browning, um, but they're actually absolutely gorgeous. And, and actually, I, I don't know if you noticed, actually, I think I, I, I cropped it so you really couldn't tell, but in the video that came out on Saturday, uh, I was sitting right next to a bunch of the garlic that I had just harvested in my salsa garden. And those bulbs are just incredibly beautiful. So when I show making salsa here in another month or two, you'll see how beautiful that those garlic bulbs are. And so um, I hope everyone that's growing garlic has some great success. They, they need the cold temperatures, but they do need some mulch protection for many of us going into winter. Amy says, how fast growing does a seed need to be for a fall started garden? And so it depends on, it, it depends on the, the the harvest of that plant <clears throat> and so for like the cucumbers and the squashes i just talked about where you can harvest in 60 or 70 days that's an important factor but there are a lot of plants that we might be growing the the swiss chard and the spinach and the even the beetroots where you can harvest the leaves long before you actually do your main harvest. And so for many of those plants, you can be harvesting in 30 days. So a beetroot might be 60 or 78, 80 days to harvest the root, but you can actually start harvesting the leaves after just a few weeks. And, and the same with a lot of the other plants. So it depends on the type of plant and what you're harvesting from that plant. But, uh, it, it, it's your garden. When is there your first freeze coming? And how much time do you have from today when you can get some seeds to when you can have that harvest? And anticipating that with a little bit of protection, with that plastic cover over it. I've got a video, I think it's almost three years old now, uh, where I show how to protect your plants in the fall, the hoops and the plastic that can give you that extra couple degree of protection you need to grow even more. So you may be growing some crops that are in the 60 to 70 day, day to harvest range, but with a little bit extra protection, you buy yourself an extra couple weeks. And so now that means you can put plants in in the 80 to 90 day range. If you've got 70 days between now and your first frost, and you plan to use those protection measures like the plastic that will buy you an extra two weeks, well, now all of a sudden you're in the 80 to 85 day range, which gives you a lot of options for your plant selection. So, it's, you know, this, uh, you hear me all the time talk about the garden journal and tracking your own garden and getting to know your own weather. This is a big reason why. When you can notice your trends in fall and in spring as well, you can begin to develop your plan for when you can put the seeds in and what kind of seeds you can put in the ground as well. It's not going to be foolproof because we had a hard, hard freeze a couple years ago in September beyond a frost, so cold that the plastic couldn't cover it very unusual, almost never happens. You can't plan for that to be a regular activity, but you can plan for that average date when the frost is going to come and how you're going to protect the plants and choose the plants for, for that type of garden. Shandy's garden says it's the perfect time to do carrots and rutabaga and kale and anything that can be taken out as you need it. Swiss chard and all the root crops, absolutely. You, you're spot on. And this is exactly what I'm talking about in the plant selection. That now is the time to be putting in all of those kind of plants. And some will do better than others. And most of them should do pretty well. 
but it really does come down to your season and how much more time you've got. And so Dwayne is wondering what herbs are there that are hardy enough to withstand a first frost. So actually quite a few. So um, my thyme, my tarragon, my sage, uh, even the, uh, uh, the lavender, uh, all hold up pretty well to cool conditions. And so I've, I've harvested thyme. Uh, well into the cold season. So it, it, it's an extremely hardy plant. So most of the perennial herbs can actually handle some cool conditions without too much difficulty. The annual herbs or the herbs that we grow as annuals, uh, like, like basil, it doesn't do as well. Uh, well, it doesn't do good at all when it hits the freezing temperatures. Um, some of the others like, like dill, doesn't doesn't hold up as well but usually the dill is actually fading before it ever reaches that point um, cilantro doesn't do well in parsley um, parsley can actually hold up to some cold temperatures um, but in the freezes the the leaves are are going to be affected by that so uh, the perennial herbs are the ones that you need to look for Dwayne if, if you're thinking about being able to harvest and uh, Vanessa is saying, I killed my oregano. Uh, oregano is actually a pretty tough plant uh, in most situations. I can actually hold up to uh, the cold weather uh, at, as an option. So and I think someone else was talking about uh, oregano as well. So it's pretty tough. Yeah, I went says sage is eternal. It, it's a tough plant. I love my sage and it's been flowering. I love the flowering sage. It's absolutely wonderful. Uh, Anita saying, I've never eaten chard, so any suggestions? Welcome. Is it similar to spinach? So you can eat chard a couple different ways. The leaves are very similar to spinach. And so that's how I cook my chard is, is focusing on the leaves and sauteing them with some garlic and some onion and some olive oil. And it's that, that simple. Just like I would saute spinach, I saute uh, the Swiss chard really tasty. It could be colorful depending on what kind of chard you have. The stalks, uh, you can chop up and do the same thing. You can, you can saute the, the, the stalks of the chard. What I'm planning on doing this year, and I'm hoping to actually have a video on it, is to make pickles. I like to make pickles with my Swiss chard. And so it's, it's the leaves sauteed and it's the the stock as a pickle. Those are my preferred methods, but you can also chop up the stock and saute them as well. And, and, and I've done that uh, in, I, I put the, the charred stocks in soups and stews. That's an option as well. Almost anything that you might use celery in, you could use the, the Swiss chard stock as well. So hope that gives you a couple ideas. And I'm sure there will be others that are spreading some ideas as well. Karen says, I have lettuce and spinach just up in the window for putting out soon. With the cold, the spinach, lettuce, radishes are bolting. Um, and, and so I think you probably talked about the, the heat. So th that's one issue about starting too early for a fall garden is those very fast growing plants like the lettuce and the spinach. If you have a prolonged summer, they'll bolt before you can get to the fall garden. And so it's it's the longer growing plants that I think are best to put in at the peak of summer. And I usually wait until the temperatures start dropping. So it'll be another three month or three weeks or so before I start sowing my lettuce and spinach again. But at, as you're saying, you probably just started them a little bit too early in the window and now they're getting a little too hot and they're bolting and i just harvested some radishes yesterday as a matter of fact that that i was growing under shade cloth and they hadn't bolted yet and so when you are putting in your fall garden the seeds and the seedlings emerge and they start growing and it's still hot use shade cloth put shade cloth over those plants try to cool those plants and then hopefully as the plant gets bigger now the temperatures are cool enough that they're not going to bolt. And that's one of the biggest advantages to growing a fall garden is that you're not going to have the bolting 
of the plants like you would have going from spring to summer. So I would say, Karen, go ahead and do spinach and lettuce and radishes again. And hopefully, the you know, delay a week or two and you won't have the bolting problem as you go into... Uh, oh, aren't, Karen says, aren't bolting. Oh, there you go. Okay. <clears throat> well, I think probably everything I just said is what, what you were talking about. When you when you grow them now to put into the fall garden, that's the advantage. They don't bolt because of the cool conditions. So glad we can clear that up. So Travis is wondering what type of tarragon uh, in Colorado Springs grow the Russian tarragon. And I'm in Colorado Springs and I grow the Russian tarragon as well because it can overwinter. And yeah, it's I, I, I agree with you. It's not, I, I like the French tarragon taste better. But my Russian tarragon just goes crazy. It, it loves it, and it comes back every winter. I have grown French tarragon, and it has come back, but, but the Russian tarragon uh, is, is just absolutely taking over. It's, it's like four feet tall right now. I actually need to go out and prune it because it's growing so well right now. Uh, okay, let's see. I saw somebody just pop up. I'm going to scroll down. It's Suffolk Shepherd. Nice to see you. Is a rule of thumb for starting seedlings inside or outside? For example, it's 95 for a high and 70 for a low. Do I start lettuce inside or outside in some shade? Um, good question. Really good question. And so, again, I look at how long it takes for the plant to grow. If you start lettuce inside, it's going to be ready to harvest in 30 days. So if you're starting it now inside and then putting it outside, in a couple of weeks, it's probably still going to be too hot and may bolt before it actually uh, grows into a harvestable lettuce. So those quick growing plants, I typically am not starting indoors in summer. Instead, I'm waiting until, for me, about the middle of August because they'll grow fast enough that just as they're starting to reach maturity, the temperatures are definitely cooling down. If it's a plant like uh, Brussels sprouts or uh, broccoli, something that takes longer to grow, then go ahead and start those indoors in summer when it's hot outside and then transplant them out when they're three or four weeks old, the conditions are starting to cool. And now those plants can actually grow pretty well. They prefer the cooler weather. And so the, the, the plants that take a longer time to grow, start them indoors in summer and then transplant outside. The plants that are very quick to grow, just go ahead and, and start them directly in the garden uh, in summer. And, and they should do fine. So um, hope that helps. Thank you for that contribution, Suffolk Shepherd. I really appreciate it. Uh, the, the 95 for, for a high, so 95 is 35 degrees Celsius. Uh, I, I like to let things cool down a little bit. The, the soil temperature can actually be too hot for some of these cool season plants. These are seeds that will germinate when the soil temperature is 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius, cool soil. And so when those same seeds are exposed to the 90 or 95 degree temperatures, they actually don't germinate as well. So allowing it to cool down before you start some of those seeds is another good idea. I, I generally wait until, you know, rule of thumb idea, <clears throat> I wait until after the daytime temperatures are regularly below 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 Celsius. When the daytime temperatures are that cool and when the nighttime temperatures are regularly below 60 degrees Fahrenheit, that's about 15 Celsius. Those are my general rules of thumb for me for when I'm gonna put the seeds in the ground because that's showing a general trend that I've gone past the peak temperatures and things are cooling down and the plants will benefit from it. So um, hope that helps, but yeah, definitely consider the shade. 
if you put some of those seeds in the ground anticipating the cool off and then the cool off doesn't happen be ready with the shade cloth be ready to to artificially cool down those plants Jeanette B thank you for that super chat as well been listening in the car but have to get out thanks for another great chat great to have you here you can always catch up on replay of course and catch up on the stuff you miss now that you're out of the car but thanks you for that thanks for being here I appreciate it okay let's see what we have Anita says love chard I've used it in many dishes super easy to grow and looks pretty so yeah it's one of those I I did my I did the video uh, a few weeks back where I was talking about my survival garden plants and showing all the different Swiss chard and and someone made a comment basically like nobody needs that much chard well I, I disagree you know pick a plant you could you could I think I've got about 25 tomato plants growing right now and you can make that argument nobody needs that many tomato plants I've got a couple dozen cucumbers nobody needs that many cucumbers well it depends on your own garden and what you choose to do and Swiss chard is not a mainstream plant but once you figure out that you can saute it and use it as pickles and rabbit food and chicken food and whatever else you want to use the chard for it, it's a wonderful plant and, and I agree it's colorful and I love the plant itself it's absolutely beautiful in my opinion so it's a wonderful thing to grow Greg started cuca melons zucchini and pole beans outside and cabbage kale broccoli and cauliflower inside a few days ago zone 5b great choice and and so that's a real good example using Greg and this is what what I'm talking about cabbage and kale and broccoli and cauliflower take time to establish and so starting those inside now or within the last week or so is a great idea so thank you for that Greg because that's exactly what I'm talking about now they can be transplanted outside when the temperatures are cooling and everything will be ready for the fall garden moving forward so uh, I, I can't give you an exact date for your garden these are guidelines you're gonna have to figure that out yourself but the concepts and the general guideline are definitely going to be appropriate for all of this okay oh yeah there you go Susan says chard and basil make an excellent salad I do I do actually I like to do that I like to make salads with with the basil fresh basil with some spinach leaves with some lettuce leaves with some chard leaves with some kale leaves uh I, I, I don't like chunky salads I like leafy salads but chard is wonderful in salads it, with some arugula as well yeah absolutely wonderful uh, also think about putting mint in I, I put basil in a lot of my salads but I also put mint leaves in my salads as well and it's just one of those little extra flavors that you take a bite of a salad with a little mint leaf in it and it just pops you up it's like oh what was that and, uh, really tasty stuff Suffolk Shepherd, thank you sweet potato vines are growing all over the garden does pruning tipping help or hurt will the cuttings produce if propagated uh, so uh, you can try trellising them up and that might help clean things up a little bit you can prune but re remember that that the leaves are are sending energy down into the roots and that's what you're going to be harvesting so all the energy from the stems and the leaves are going into the sweet potato that you're going to be harvesting so if you prune you're taking away some of that energy you may or may not notice in the end the size of the sweet potato I try to reduce the amount of pruning I do on the sweet potatoes because I'm just thinking I want as much energy packed into that as possible and everything I prune off is less energy so uh, that's the basic guideline I follow uh, yes if, if you've got a, a long enough season we were talking about zone 9 earlier yeah you could actually propagate from the cuttings of your sweet potatoes uh, the the slips that we plant are nothing more than stems that were cut off from a sweet potato and then those are rooted and that grows into a sweet potato vine you can take cuttings and do the same thing uh, it will take time to to develop roots and grow a plant 
and then grow more sweet potatoes. So depending on the kind of sweet potato you're growing, if it's going to take 90 days to harvest, well, you can take cuttings and root them and plant them and then in 90 days get a whole nother crop. So if you've got that much time left, yeah, throw that into your fall garden plans as well because that's a, a very effective way of propagating is the slips, the, those stems of the sweet potato that will root and grow into a whole new plant. So if, if you've got the time, might be worth the effort. And uh, I, I, my season, I don't have the time. I'm hoping that I'll get sweet potatoes this year. I've got a whole bunch of sweet potatoes growing and I'm hoping we don't get one of those early freezes that'll take out the plants. But And that's why I'm leaving all of the leaves in place because I want the plant to grow as big and I want the roots to develop as much as possible in the short season I have. <clears throat> okay, yeah, and Jay says, um, trying to trellis up my sweet potato in the small garden. And that can be, a, that can be an effective way to to get control over those vines, get them off the ground and still not have to prune so that they can absorb all that sunlight and all that wonderful energy that goes into uh, what it is that you want to be harvesting. <clears throat> and your little dog is saying, planted an apple tree two months ago and trained branches laterally. The new growth is in bloom. Should I pinch off the blossoms? Uh, yeah, in the first year, <clears throat> and generally in the first two years, it's, it's beneficial to prune off the blossoms. When you put a new tree in the ground, like a fruit tree, it stresses the plant. And a stressed plant wants to propagate. And it's going to direct its energy into producing fruit. And so a new apple tree that you just put in the ground, it, it's stressed, especially if you're, if you're already doing some pruning and training of branches and it's sending out those blossoms because it, it wants to propagate. It's doing that at the expense of the root growth and the root development. So pinch off those blossoms because you really want the first two years of your fruit trees to be all about the roots, to really, really develop a good foundation for the tree and that'll help out going into the future. So yeah, I it's hard, I, I, all of us, that are growing fruit trees, especially in the first or second year, you see those blossoms and you want that apple, but it's better for the tree to just go ahead and pinch those off and you'll have better long-term results if you do that. Uh, but, but it's tough. Anytime you pinch off a blossom, uh, it is tough. Gardening, gardening warriors wondering, do you ever eat the leaves of your sweet potatoes? I don't. Uh, you can. The, the leaves of the sweet potatoes are great. Uh, they tend to be a little too bitter for my taste. Um, but now that you say that, I should probably consider adding them to that mixed salad I was just talking about. Uh, I've, I've only eaten the sweet potato leaves by themselves, but actually uh, it would probably be good to add them like arugula to a mixed salad. So interesting idea. I've never done that before, but now you got me thinking. I think maybe I will do that. Absolutely. Uh, uh, an option. The The sweet potato I'm growing is a purple sweet potato and the leaves are actually purple. And so that could be kind of fun to add purple leaves to a garden salad. So uh, great idea. I'm, I'm, I don't know if you're asking because you do it, but yes, you could definitely eat the leaves of your sweet potato uh, and see if you like the flavor. It's, it, it's kind of like like kale and arugula where it's got that really strong flavor and if you like that flavor then go for it it's definitely something to think about um, priscilla saying in zone five my potato potato leaves are dying is this normal probably it it depending on when you put the potatoes in the ground again it doesn't matter that you're in zone five it's all about your your summer season and when you put your put your seed potatoes in the ground and how long they take to mature and whether it's time or not. That's usually a sign that the potatoes are ready to harvest, is that the, the plant starts dying back. <clears throat> and so if they've been in the ground for two, two and a half, three months, depending on what type of potato you're growing, it might be close to harvest. So I have a video about this uh, where I, I show that and talk about 
the the potato plants dying back and different signs you can look for to harvest your potatoes and so you can check out i think i think i did it last year and no doubt jay will give a link to it here in a little bit but uh yeah it could be completely normal for your potato plants to to be dying back and getting close to harvest time uh, if if they've been in the ground for a few months then yeah that, that could be totally normal because that's exactly what you're looking for uh, okay let's see yeah uh, one says arugula by itself is gross yeah I, I'm not a well you know I, I take it back so actually um, I'm not a I wasn't a big fan of arugula by itself I add it to a salad but my garden club we just had a garden party a few weeks ago where we all got together and uh, potluck and one of the, the the garden club members brought an arugula salad now the the arugula was 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 sliced into slivers and it was a really nice pretty strong vinaigrette and it was just arugula and it was fantastic i i don't know that i have had a straight arugula salad before but it was actually really good it was intense but but it was actually really good so uh yeah i usually put it in in small amounts into another salad but with the right vinaigrette dressing um it was actually pretty good so awkward human is wondering what's the name of the variety of sweet potato with the purple leaves so uh what i'm doing and this is the video that that i'll be making and i hope i can actually harvest the sweet potatoes i just went to my supermarket we were talking earlier about uh, what you can just get at your supermarket and plant and I, I mentioned a couple videos one of the videos I'm doing is on sweet potatoes and I just went to my supermarket and there was a little sign for organic purple sweet potatoes and so I bought one and I I grew slips from it and then I rooted those slips and I'm now growing I think I've got 14 sweet potato plants that I got from that one sweet potato that I got at the supermarket. I have no idea what the variety is. It's just purple sweet potato that was being sold at the store. And that's what I'm growing. And so um, beautiful plant. You'll see it in the videos to come, whether I can harvest or not. I'll, I'll talk about that in the video. So I wish I could give you the name of the variety. But uh, if your supermarket sells organic purple sweet potatoes, You'll be able to watch the video and see how I did it for next year. You can do the same thing. Sometimes that can actually be a lot of fun trying some of those unique plants that you might not be able to find in a seed catalog. It, it, it's crazy. Uh, Heidi's wondering, can arugula be planted as a fall crop? Absolutely. Arugula is actually a pretty, pretty sturdy plant. It can handle some cool conditions. So arugula as a fall plant is definitely an option. As are most lettuces. And uh, most of those leafy greens that we grow in the spring, yeah, absolutely. You can be planting those as a fall crop and, and expect them to be pretty good. Saudi Gal does arugula with beets, goat cheese, and juniper berries. Oh, wonderful. And on pizza with balsamic vinegar. Oh, I haven't heard of that. I've had arugula with goat cheese and beets before um, and also with like raisins, but um, Juniper berries are an interesting idea, and the, the pizza is an interesting idea. Don't you love the, the culinary ideas that we pass on the on the uh, on the Mondays that we have together? I, I think this was fantastic. Shandy's Garden says my garden club is planning a perennial potluck. We're going to trade perennials once we can pull them and bring them bring some of our dishes we've made from the summer harvest. That's awesome. Yeah, I you've heard me say this occasionally. If you can find a local gardening club join it because it's so great to just rub elbows with other gardeners and and learn things but also have potlucks and share plants and share seeds we'll be doing a seed swap here in a couple months same type of thing great opportunity because especially if you're new to gardening and you don't really know what does best yet in your area it meet some of these gardeners who may have been gardening for 50 years in your area you know, not to stereotype but most of the members of my garden club tend to be older and they've been gardening for a long time 
and you can get some great information from those old experienced gardeners if you're new and just moving into an area and trying to figure out about the area and the weather and the soil and all those other things so garden clubs can definitely be a lot of fun uh, <clears throat> Catherine saying if i have aphids on my greens does that mean my plants are not healthy not necessarily so so yes aphids and most insect pests do tend to attack the weaker plants first that doesn't mean that they're not going to be on a healthy plant but it just means that plant is a little bit weaker it doesn't mean it's not healthy it just may mean that that the leaves were damaged maybe it was stressed due to weather at just the moment that the aphids showed up so it could be very healthy it just could have been a weakened or stressed plant that the aphids decided to attack so if everything else looks good if the growth is good if the rest of the garden is good i wouldn't worry too much about it not being healthy it could just be a bad day for that plant and that's when the aphids decided to attack it and it's not that big a deal aphids can be sprayed off with a a, a good strong spray of water and they bring in the lace wings and the ladybugs and all the beneficial predators so a few aphids aren't bad yeah it makes the leaf look kind of ugly if you're wanting to eat it but it's not that big a deal especially if it's something you can saute up in a pan you don't even notice that it's been eaten by some insect pests so usually not that big of an issue while i'm thinking about it let's go ahead and talk about the background today this comes from melissa martin and this is actually pretty close to me just uh down the road a bit and wanted to to show some of the things if if you've seen my recent videos where i'm in my enclosed garden and i've got the hail cloth covering that whole space that's kind of what this whole area is because here in colorado we get hail you need to protect your plants and this is a great option just a nice big hoop house with these pvc supports and then hail cloth over the whole thing so you've got a garden for your region and your particular weather patterns and for those of us that are exposed to summertime hail you need to cover your plants so i think this is a great way to show an option and and you'll need to find a, a practical source i i've, I've done greenhousemegastore.com to get my shade cloth and my hail cloth in large quantities like this so if you can find a greenhouse supply and get hail cloth or shade cloth or whatever you're trying to grow in bulk like this it's one of those things that, that's really good so i think that's a great option but one of the things i really wanted to point out is too often especially if you're a renter or you're just moving into a house and your soil is terrible and here in colorado our soil is terrible which i think is a good reason why all of these plants are being grown in containers but you can also see this is rock mulch and so again here in colorado we don't get a lot of rain the soil is terrible many people have a lot of rock in their landscape because it's hard to grow plants so an option especially in an area where you're not going to be growing in the ground is all of these containers so you've got these animal troughs you've got these metal beds you've got these pots you've got grow bags over here you can see on this side a whole row of grow bags a great option like like i showed uh, a couple weeks ago grow bags next to your driveway great options to have a garden if your soil is not good enough to support a garden grow in raised beds grow in grow bags grow in pots grow in containers of all types and you can still have a beautiful garden look at all these plants that are growing this nice trellis right here is just repurposed tree branches i've done that before too i do it all the time this is a really nice functional garden and so so I'm, I'm really glad that that i could share this with you and thank you melissa for sharing it with us because there's a lot about this garden that you might consider non-traditional 
it's it's not the garden space that, that I often show in the background, but it is a beautiful garden space with lots of plants and very functional. And I'm guessing grows quite a bit of food for Melissa and her family. So take a look at this, start thinking about maybe how you could use some of these ideas, especially if you have an area like this that is just a bunch of rock just a bunch of gravel, something you can't do anything else to, make a garden with containers on top of that space that you can't do anything with. It's uh, absolutely wonderful. And then the, you know, as an example as well, you can see this shade cloth covers this whole hoop area and you just pull it up. I'm guessing it's tied or clamped. That's how you get in. And then when the hail comes, you just drop the hail cloth and everything is protected. So you got a garden to protect your plants. And I think this is a beautiful way to, to show one option using hail cloth and a big hoop house to protect your plants. So uh, it's, it's always nice to see the different ways that we garden. And hopefully you all can pick up a few ideas for how to do it as well. If you look back here, it's hard to tell. These look like these might be some fruit trees or some type of tree that's grown around this grass area. And I'm not sure if this is a little garage or a little pergola area, but uh, it's nice to see all the stuff growing. And then back here, flowers for the pollinators. That's everything a garden needs right there. So that's the background for the day. If you've got your garden that you wanna showcase, send it to Gardener Scott at gardenerscott.com and I'll add it to the queue. And hopefully we'll get your picture up there as well and tell me a little bit about it and we can share it and all your good ideas can be used by all the others as well. It's always nice to see that kind of stuff. Frank says, found soil is better than most think in my area, but can play basketball on it if it's dry. <coughs> yeah, I have that problem. But the Gulf of Mexico can bring way too much. Got to deal with it. Yeah, absolutely. You got to deal with what you have. Soil's too wet, soil's too dry, all those kind of issues. That's why I like the containers and the, the raised beds in my area in particular. <coughs> the, the one thing I also wanted to talk about when we, when we talk about fall gardens is the taste of some of what we grow. If you're growing beetroot, if you're growing most root crops in spring, and then you're harvesting in earlier midsummer, they taste great because it comes from your own garden. But if you grow those same root crops starting in summer into fall, they can taste incredibly different, most often better. And so if you think about how a plant is growing and you got the leaves putting all the energy into the roots, and especially these root vegetables. When they're exposed to that first frost, the plant has now been signaled, hey, winter's coming. You better put all of those starches and sugars into the root to survive over the winter. And the plant does that. So most people who are growing root crops and harvesting after the first frost will tell you that the plant or the root tastes sweeter, it tastes better. And that's because the plant is taking all those sugars from the leaves and injecting them down into the roots in survival mode. And you benefit from it by harvesting after the frost. So think about that as a reason to do fall gardening is it actually tastes better for some of the plants that we're growing. And, and I love the sweet beets of October that I'm harvesting. They're just absolutely incredible. To roast the, the turnips and the parsnips and the beets and, and throw in some onions, uh, just, just a wonderful way to, to serve some of those root vegetables. And, and that's one of the things I like to do in autumn as part of my fall garden. It, and it, and it, it just <laughs> keeps producing. And, and I, I just love having fall gardens every year. R&R says, my water mountain has stopped producing flowers of any kind since it has two water melons growing on it. Any idea what's going on? The melons themselves are not getting very big thoughts. It could be the heat. 
uh, the when the temperatures start getting very high, like at the peak of summer, the blossoms are going to drop right off or the plant might not be putting out any new blossoms. But also when plants are in that survival mode, when they actually have fruit on the vines and that fruit is maturing, many plants, that part of the flower set is done. They put all the flowers out until they get pollination and fruit set. And now they don't put more flowers out because especially with melons, it might take three months for those melon plants to grow and produce the melons. And so it's not going to be growing a lot of flowers at the two month point or at the three month point because the plant just doesn't live that long to produce more fruit. And so it's part of the cycle of the growth of that particular plant. And, and cucumbers tend to be the same way where cucumbers, once they fruit, they'll start putting out fewer and fewer flowers as the plant gets older and older. And so an old cucumber plant will give you very few blossoms. That's when it's time to start thinking about pulling it. So especially with these melons, don't worry too much about no new flowers developing. That's probably perfectly normal for that variety. And when you harvest those melons, pull the plant and put in a fall garden. Put in some of those indoor plants that you might be thinking about growing now that we've been talking about it. Part, put in some of those fast growing seeds and that same space that was growing the melons can grow your fall garden. Depending on how sprawling those plants are, you can actually put seeds in before the cucumbers and the melons and the squashes, squashes are finished. And so I, I like that method. I do a lot of that because I'm growing most of my vining plants vertically. There's space near the roots that gets sunlight and the air circulation. And so I'll start putting in some of those seeds. I'll put in the seeds of spinach and lettuce and radish and all the others that we've talked about in my cucumber beds and in my tomato beds and in my squash beds to start growing, knowing that those plants are either getting close to being finished or as soon as the first frost hits, those plants are going to die. Well, I've already got the seeds in that bed sown and those plants are already growing. And so it's not unusual. In fact, I like to think of it as, as normal to have uh, spinach plants that are getting close to harvest at about the time that you're cutting back your your tomato plants that just got killed by the first frost. So you, you cut back those dead tomatoes and cucumbers and squashes. And now already growing in that bed is the chard and the spinach and the beetroot and all those other plants. So don't think of it as an either or kind of scenario where you can only grow the one type of plant in a bed, and then you have to wait till that plant is out to put something else in. You can overlap the growing times of many of these plants. With the melons specifically, you know, they may have overtaken the space and there's not enough light to, uh, to grow the young seedlings. But I wouldn't worry too much about them not growing or not adding any more flowers. Um, and actually two watermelons, uh, that may actually be completely normal. Most of the melons I've grown, I'm lucky to get to, if I'm really lucky, three melons on my plant. So it could also be just the variety of plant that's giving you a limited number of, of melons. Because you got to think how the plant grows. Once that fruit has set, the plant's not going to put a lot of energy into growing new flowers. It's going to put energy into those melons. So two or three melons on a watermelon plant, perfectly normal, absolutely normal for, for most of, of us that are trying to grow melons. Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, uh, Gardens Happen says, I like to plant between whatever I still have. There you go. Yeah, that's exactly the, the idea is to start growing in between the plants that are growing now, anticipating how long those in-between plants take to grow and then absolutely take advantage of it. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. So hi, Melissa. There you are. Thanks for 
for being here. Thanks for your background. Those are sunflower stalks. Great idea. I actually had a stack of sunflower stalks as well that I had been using as uh, a trellis. And then Mala likes to chew on sticks and Mala has pretty much eaten up all of my sunflower stalks. But yeah, great idea. Sunflower stalks are very sturdy and can absolutely, especially the tall ones, be used as a trellis. So great idea. Thanks for thank, thanks for that suggestion. Definitely something to, to keep in mind as you're looking for trellising ideas. Because uh, they can be really woody, very strong when it comes to uh, a, a plant that can be reused. Grow an eight foot tall sunflower and then reuse that 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 stock and it'll definitely be something that uh, will find a place in its garden. Uh, <clears throat> and so mornings at the allotments wondering what's realistic for something like sugar baby. And so I grow sugar baby. It's one of those those fast growing melons that I can grow in my area and harvestable melons when the when I'm harvesting but right before the frost. I'm lucky to get two or three on my plants. And so uh, so when I was talking about two or three being normal for something like Sugar Baby or Moon and Stars, yeah, just a, a couple melons on a plant is completely normal. Um, I don't grow any of the varieties that, that give more than that, especially the big, big watermelons. If you live in an area with a long season and you can grow the big watermelons, you're only going to get a couple melons per per vine and and that's that's completely normal and and absolutely um, expected if you look at it that way shandy's garden picks up branches and things as well that people put out uh, using sunflower stalks and metal poles and rods and structures yeah flexibility use what you got and make it happen and grow the plants that you can that's what it's all about and and, and i like using it i've got I still have some tree branch trellises that I've been using for three years. I think, I think I did a video about three years ago where I showed growing tomatoes up my tree branch trellises. And I still have those same tree branches to, to use as trellises as well. So absolutely something to think about. Warnings at the allotment saying my season's a bit longer than their, their season's longer than mine and growing undercover. I might consider taking off any fruit after the first three yeah and so that's that's a, a good way to also think about a fall garden before the frost kills the plant and so for tomatoes for cucumbers for melons for squashes as you're approaching the end of the season for those plants as you're approaching that first frost yeah go ahead and pluck off the flowers that might be developing because you really don't want the plant's energy going into growing new fruit that's not going to have enough time to grow. So pluck off those flowers so that energy can now be redirected into the fruit. And again, it puts the plant in survival mode. It wants to grow fruit. And now if all of a sudden all of its new flowers are all it knows is they're being destroyed. So it could be a deer, a rabbit. They don't know something is destroying those blossoms. It's going to redirect the bulk of the energy into ripening the fruit that's already on the plant. And so get those tomatoes and cucumbers and squashes plucked of flowers three weeks before your first expected frost. And that, that'll absolutely help the plant. Yeah develop that that fruit that's on the plant so after the first three especially if it's a if it's a melon yeah if 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 you have melons and you have three melons on your plant and you have more flowers appear after the melons have appeared there's no reason to even attempt to try to grow more than those melons on the plant plant may not be strong enough to support more than two or three and plucking the flowers is a, is a great idea I actually like that uh, okay let's see Intrinsic one says, awesome idea. I'm going to try using an okra stock for trellising. Yeah, I, I, I'm seeing some stuff pop up about the okra right now. So uh, I, I missed that original comment. But okra can easily grow six, seven feet tall. And it's also very, very thick and sturdy. 
and can be used as a, a, a trellis support as well. So if, if you're growing the tall okra and you wonder what to do with it, it's too thick and woody to put in the compost pile. I mean, you can put it in the compost pile. It just takes a long time to break down. But trellising is a wonderful idea. Look at all these wonderful ideas that we're having for, for trellising. So Rands is saying, I'm planning on adding vegetable seeds to my raised bed with tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, marigolds. What companion vegetables are ideal in zone eight with 90 days to frost? Almost anything. And so uh, companion plants should match with water and sun needs. And so if you're growing tomatoes and peppers and eggplants and marigolds, all which have similar sun and water needs, you can put in just about anything that we've already been talking about going into the fall garden. Because you've got 90 days to go, this could be a great opportunity for the cucumbers and the squashes, which have the same water and sun needs as the peppers and the tomatoes and the, the eggplants. So yeah, think about putting in some, uh, some squashes and cucumbers that as you, as you take out, as you harvest the eggplants, which probably is coming up pretty soon, cut back to the ground those eggplant plants, and now the cucumbers will already be germinating and ready to take over the same space as the eggplant. And uh, the, the, the tomatoes, I'm sure the tomatoes and the peppers, you can continue to grow for another 90 days. So think about putting in some, some basil and some cilantro and maybe some herbs to go with the peppers and the tomatoes. That can also be an option. You might also be, be able to grow beans. Think about growing some, some pole beans. And you can use those tomatoes and whatever the trellis is for the tomatoes that you're growing, grow beans in that same bed right next to your tomatoes. And you should have enough time for the beans to grow and grow up the same trellis, even up the tomato plant in 90 days. So you got a lot of options. Uh, just comes down to how much space you have and which of those plants you're going to take out and which of those plants you're going to leave in place. But uh, do think about the water and the sun needs and try to match the plant to how much you're watering the plants that are already in it. Uh, and, and yeah, YD says eggplants can be overwintered like peppers. It helps with the short growing season or gardening seasons and getting produce earlier. And so, yeah, if you can overwinter uh, your plants, especially if you have a, a mild winter, that's definitely something to think about. My winter is so long, I have a hard time overwintering uh, because I would have to, to start overwintering my peppers in September. And I can't put them back in the ground until June. And so for some of us, overwintering for nine months can be difficult, which is a big reason why I'm not overwintering the, the plants like the peppers and the eggplants. But if you've got a much shorter winter, uh, great suggestion. Definitely consider overwintering some of those plants. So had a had a nice return from my trip. I returned from the trip and my daughter had been collecting my mail and waiting for me was my copy of Composting Masterclass. This is Tony O'Neill's book and I thought Tony was going to be with us today. I haven't seen him check in but I did put a link to uh, his book in the description below because when the book came out and Tony was on the show for those of you that remember when his book came out and all kinds of problems with Amazon and not having his book available for sale. But I just wanted to point out that recently, in recent weeks, Amazon now has the paperback available for sale. So if you were looking for Tony O'Neill's book and you are an Amazon buyer, you can actually find it on Amazon now. And I went ahead and, and put that link in the description below and was gonna say hi to Tony because he had had said that he might be on with us today, but yeah, it's always nice when you when you take a trip and you're ready to be home and you're done, and then you find something like a nice book in the mail and you can read it again. I read it as the electronic version, 
And so now it's just, it's so nice to have as a hard, hard copy version that I can actually look at the diagrams and sit in my chair and read it at my leisure. So uh, great book, great, great, something you, you can and should add to your gardening library. Uh, so I have a, a, a point that I, that I wanted to bring up that also came about from my trip. So, so I went to California, visited with a, with a whole bunch of family members that in some cases I haven't seen in 20 years. It was great to catch up, great to, to see everybody and, and meet with my, my aunt and uncle. The, the aunt is actually the daughter of the aunt that I've mentioned before, the, my, my, my aunt who had the garden. And so when I say aunt and uncle, I, there are aunts and uncles to, to lots of others in our family. They're actually my cousins, but we're at that age that we don't think of each other as cousins anymore. We're the elder aunts and uncles in the family to all of our siblings. But the, these two in particular, my, my cousin Don planted fruit trees about 15 years ago. And so I can remember about 15 years ago, he was showing me these brand new fruit trees. That's when I was really getting involved with gardening and learning a lot more. And so he was pointing out to me that he's not getting any crops this year, that they're, they had a late freeze in spring, killed all the blossoms, all these beautiful trees are, look great, but they're not producing any fruit. And many of us have had those kind of turmoils this year. The summer has been so hot that we're not getting the harvest or it's killing the plants. Or the spring was so late in coming that we got a late start in our garden. Or the winter just held on forever and was killing plants that normally wouldn't be killed and they were growing too early. There's just been so many weird weather things that have been affecting us. Right now, we've got floods. Kentucky is, is underwater. California is burning. There are so many things that can go wrong in our gardens that, what are you going to do? You got to make that choice. And so I'm asking you to, in those situations, when things just don't turn out the way you want them to turn out, why are you gardening in the first place? And so my cousin Don is growing fruit trees because he likes growing fruit trees. It's nice to harvest those apples and pears and have as fruit into the winter, but he's not reliant on that. He likes growing fruit trees. So when you lose an entire crop, if you're doing it because you like doing it, it's not as devastating. It's still hard that you've lost your whole crop, but it's, it's, it's not a terrible event. You'll recover and there's always next year. I garden because I like to garden. So when my garden is devastated by hail, well, that happens. I'll start over next year. I'll have a better year next year. If you're gardening for food, and actual support of your family, you need to anticipate that these things can happen. So for many of us, we just garden and accept that bad stuff happens. If you're gardening for a different reason, you may want to do something like this. You cover your whole garden with hail cloth because you can't afford to lose your entire garden. You may learn, have to learn about the varieties to grow so that you don't have some of those issues. The, the apple tree varieties, the plum tree, the peach tree varieties that I chose are late producers. They're not going to put their blossoms on in early spring because I get those freezes in spring. So I chose variety of fruit trees that are less likely to have those kind of problems in spring. It's too late for my cousin Don, who is going to be recovering for a whole year before he gets fruit again. But it raises the question for those of you who might be starting 
a home orchard. 15 years from now, do you want to have the type of trees growing that can handle those weird weather events that we're starting to see more and more? Take the time to learn. Like I talked about towards the beginning, learn about your weather and what's going to impact the type of gardening you're going to do. Be it a fall garden, a spring garden, a home orchard, selecting the right kind of plants to match with your climate and your regional weather really becomes important. And one way to learn to do that is to stretch your gardening knowledge to the edges, like with a fall garden or with an early spring garden. So if you haven't done it before, start doing it. Start growing some of these plants now, this year, so you can see what happens. You Hopefully you'll have great success and you can tell us all about it. Maybe not. That's also a good thing. If you try growing plants and they don't work, that's, that's just as educational. Last year, I tried growing Brussels sprouts from seed, sowing in summer, hoping to have them grow into fall. Brussels sprouts take a long time to, to grow and to actually get a harvest. I learned last year that that wasn't going to work for me, that, that it's just not enough time with the way that my autumn cools down and I get those freezes. So I didn't do it this year, but if I want to grow Brussels sprouts again, I need to start the Brussels sprouts from seed indoors and then transplant them out for my fall garden. I didn't know that until this last year because I hadn't tried it before until this last year. I've grown Brussels sprouts in spring, but I'd never tried growing them in fall. So push your limits a little bit. Try growing some of these plants that maybe you haven't grown into the fall before and see what happens. And jot it all down in your garden journal and then decide if you need to change something, if you need to put up some kind of protection, if you need a plastic for those extra degrees of coverage when temperatures get cold. See if you need to choose a different variety or maybe it's just not going to work and now you know that as well. You got to get out there, you got to do it and tie it back to why you're gardening in the first place. I'm gardening because I like doing it, but also I like learning about all of this stuff. Use that to your benefit as you move forward and as you start thinking about not only today and next month and what you're going to be harvesting in three months, but tie it into next year as well as you start planning an entire season because of what you learned about this year. So hope that helps. Hope that has you thinking about some new plants and some new things you're going to be trying over the next couple months because this really can be an exciting time of year to still have harvests, harvests, many more harvests in the months to come. It doesn't have to be over once the summer crops have faded. There you have it. So glad to be back. So glad to be here on Monday with you. And of course, I'll be back next Monday. Hope to see you all here as well. And I hope you have a great gardening week. I'm going to get out there and deal with some of the weeds that are growing everywhere because of all these rains that we've been having. So I'm in weed mode right now. I hope you're in some type of mode that takes you out to your garden so that you can enjoy gardening. I'm Gardner Scott. See you next Monday.